but without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, give a big round of applause to uh, Mr. Erickson, uh, System Designer at OP5. Go ahead and put your hands together. Thank you very much. Um, today I will treat you to an exciting journey through this presentation, which I hasn't, haven't written myself. So I've added a few slides, but uh, some of it may come as a surprise to me as much as it does to you. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. <coughs> right, I'm going to be talking about Merlin, which is a redundancy recipe for Nagios. And since this presentation is not quite as cramped as the other one, I will also talk a bit about OP5, an OP5 monitor, which is our product that we build on around Nagios. Uh, the need for distributed monitoring and for high availability monitoring. Uh, some brief stuff about concept and implementation, what our rules are for Merlin. Uh, some examples and scenarios, a pretty cool customer case. Um, well, more info is a bit of a lie. It's just two URLs that you can visit at your leisure. <coughs> OP5 is a company started we started at in 2003, I think, when Johannes there actually hired me. I was the first employee there from a consultancy company that just span off into a product, into product land. Uh, we specialize in doing um, high performance and high availability installations of Nagios with redundancy in every layer. Um, yay. And, uh, and very just generally very high performance. If you have a very, very large network, you will be interested in looking at things that we are doing because uh, they will help out almost certainly. <coughs> um, OP5 Monitor has the standard stuff that Nagios does for you and maps, reports, all that jazz that everybody needs. Um, we also have a need for distributed monitoring because even with very high performance code, there is only so much that one system can handle. Uh, for Mr. Wittenberg's case, with his 1.5 million services, you will be hard pressed to monitor that with any kind of sane interval on just a single system. So we need something other than that. Um, this need is actually, first of all, it's a uh, need for reliability. Uh, we have a lot of service providers as our customers, and it's just not good enough if their customers come and ask them at the end of the month, how much uptime did you have? And they say, well, we're pretty sure we only had like 20 minutes downtime, uh, but we were upgrading our monitoring solution uh, during that window, so we don't really know. That's not good because they're supposed to promise 99.97% or something like that. <coughs> um, so... Yeah, we need it for reliability and to make sure that everything is, the monitoring system is up all the time. Uh, we also need it for performance. Our, most of our customers run primarily active system checks uh, where they go out and ask the systems because if you rely on them to report in their own problems, you're sort of trusting something that isn't working to report that it's not working, but it has to work sort of okay for it to be able to do that. So. We rely mostly on system, on active checks, actually. Um, not really sure what that limitations of the operating system means, but, yeah. Yeah, possibly. Number of forks per second, I don't know. Uh, you will get to a limit where you really can't monitor a large, a very large network uh, with just one system. It's, it's not doable. <coughs> The need for distributed monitoring is um, usually it's very, very hard to, to uh, measure a user experience from just one point in your network. Uh, your users are most likely not sitting in one of your data centers and accessing your services. So it's pretty good to have something from the outside accessing your services on the inside as if they were a user. In order to do that, you need to have a separate system on a satellite node going out there. You could do it with with uh, by using a redundant line somewhere that goes out to the internet and back in again. Um, but not everybody has that. And uh, by being able to put a puller outside your own network, you get that functionality very, very cheaply. Um, 
that means you can handle. Uh, we have a we have a bunch of customers that uh, have done acquisitions and mergers with other companies, and it's a mess, a horrible mess of IP address conflicts. But if you have a poller sitting in that network, and they can talk to. They just need to be able to talk to each other. They don't have to be able to talk to each other's monitored segments of the network. You can have as many conflicts as you like, and it doesn't really matter. Um, in terms of security, you, if you have red flag networks, like red zone networks, that you can't really access from the outside, but they can report their status to the out, to, from inside to out, uh, you can put a poller in there and have it just send its, uh, send its information back up to the, to the master server. There is a point missing there. Not really sure what it was supposed to say. <coughs> this is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> right. Um, there are already solutions for doing uh, redundant and high availability, uh, high availability setups with Nagios, but they they are all more or less clunky. They rely on one system doing nothing, and then going out and activating itself if the other system goes down. But usually you get uh, a couple of minutes of downtime before the, before the failover system notices that the other system is up. So it's, and it has to sort of go to a lot of tricks. And when it does failover, you don't inherit the scheduling queue from that other system. So you could be looking at multiple check intervals where your monitoring just isn't working. It's, um, it's not fun to try to explain that if you're a service provider and the national emergency broadcast network went down and you have no idea why. So, um, yeah. Um, we get load balancing and automatic failover. So the idea is that when you have two paired systems that are supposed to take care of the load, they just share it between them. If one of them goes down, the other one will immediately notice. Actually, not immediately. It take, may take up to 30 seconds if you just firewall it off completely. But if one daemon crashes or if one system goes down entirely, we get a signal that says, oh, hey, we're, you're not talking to anyone anymore. <coughs> and then we can immediately take over the check, which are s the checks which are scheduled exactly the same on both servers. So we lose no time at all. Um, and the net network functionality, as, I, as I've already mentioned. Oh, redundancy is important. Supposed to say <laughs> the missing bullet points. Awesome. So, a few of the key features of, of uh, Merlin is performance, of course. We need to be able to handle very, very large networks. Um, <coughs> redundancy to ensure availability. I'm pretty sure those slides were supposed to be the other way around because it looks to be falling down. Um, load balancing. It really does not make sense to have one system sitting idly watching and doing nothing at all. And before we had Merlin, we had a few super, av super high availability customers that could not accept the, the downtime from, uh, from one system. So they actually had three separate Nagios installations that were all doing active checking all the time, just because one of them might go down. So they got three alerts for everything. It's like, this is insane. You know, like, yeah, we know, but we really need to have that. So. Um, and distributed monitoring, of course, for geographical coverage or the red zone networks or what have you. <coughs> so our solution for a scalable monitoring refers to an easy-to-use system capable of constantly changing to fit the needs of your business because it's very, very easy to add new pollers or new peers or whatever. And uh, it gives stability and performance. <coughs> This is a worrying slide. Concept and setups. Mm. This is the Merlin logo. Uh, Merlin stands for Module for Effortless Redundancy and Load Balancing in Nagios. I'm good with acronyms. Um, <laughs> and it's, of course, used for setting up distributed Nagios installations or high availability installations. Um, we started it in 2006 as a sort of prototype testing thing when we were still at Nagios 2. Point something back then. And we had a customer who needed to, the network of about 130,000 hosts uh, distributed geographically all over the world, mostly on 
pretty shitty satellite links for the remote offices. It was, this was a gas mining company that had on-site equipment everywhere, and they needed to make sure that their security valves and stuff were working, because if one of those gas pipes burns or explodes, they lose a lot of money, huge amounts of money. Um, it didn't really take off, and uh, they weren't too keen on rolling out a beta product in, uh, in their network. So it was put on hold for a couple of years. In 2009, we started using it as a redundancy engine. The first customer uh, that actually tried the beta code was uh, they're responsible for handling Swedish emergency broadcast channels. And they have this extremely high availability requirement. It just can't go down ever. Uh, they're also responsible for handling the, all the technology that, is, uh, that takes care of uh, 911 operator calls and stuff like that. So you can imagine the kind of availability that uh, they have to produce. <coughs> it's used in production at somewhere above 800 different installations, uh, which means that a couple of thousand systems, because most of them are peered or have pollers and stuff like that. <coughs> I think the largest production installation uh, is a Swedish defense contractor. They have multiple red zone, red flag networks. They have three masters and 14 pollers. Uh, version 2, Nagios 4 support, uh, will be released officially next week, uh, where I will actually be rolling it out at a customer in Romania. Current bleeding edge, version 2.0.0 beta 2, patch 10. <laughs> it's good info. Um, the, the, the pretty short list of really must-have requirements is this, basically. And this is what Merlin was built to, to handle, and this is something that we will never, ever step away from. Uh, peer load balancing is 100% <coughs> transparent. There have been requests to get one peer to, uh, it's called host group or service group affinity, where one peer just takes care of primarily one host group. So you can put them in your five different data centers and have them peered so that the load fails over to another one. You still have some sort of monitoring, even if you're trying to monitor Boston from Chicago or whatever. Um, that will be added eventually, but it's still not there. If you want that right now, you put a poller there. Um, pollers take care of one or more host groups. So you just assign it and say, hey, you do, you do Gothenburg, you do Asia, you do Netherlands, whatever. Um, pollers can, and they often are, peered. So you can put multiple pollers in a single location and have them share the load there. So if one of them fails, the other one will take over. If all of them fail, the masters will try to take over, unless you configure it not to. It would be quite pointless to try to hammer a firewall several hundred times per second when you know you're not getting through it anyway. Um, we're using a binary protocol. This is... Um, there is about 100 lines of black magic code in uh, Merlin, which just packs up the events we get from Nargios and ships it over the network. It's ridiculously efficient, and we can handle some pretty amazing workloads that way. But it does mean that you can't put 32-bit and 64-bit machines and have them play together. It just doesn't work. Uh, that has to do with the sizes of the members of the structures that we're shipping, and pointers are larger on 64-bit machines. We could actually make it work, but it would be silly. So it doesn't. <coughs> Object configuration of two peers must be identical, so Merlin ensures that this is the case. Uh, it does that by getting a SHA-1 hash of the configuration along with a timestamp, sending it out to its peers. And if it doesn't match, or if it will pick the configuration with the latest changed timestamp and ship that out to its peers. And then they will restart themselves. Also, one very important requirement here is that pollers must never know about objects they're not responsible for. Um, if you consider the red zone network stuff, where you actually have uh, uh, one large company buying a lot of other smaller companies, and they do defense contracts or whatever, you can't really have the guys fiddling with the image recognition for Tomahawk missiles, uh, knowing about nuclear weapons development because they just happen to share a, a monitoring system. So uh, pollers must never ever know about objects they're not responsible for. 
This is handled by the, by the master server splitting out the configuration, just handing it out to the poller and saying, here, this is your configuration, you take care of this, you schedule the checks and you tell me when they're done. <coughs> that works pretty well. System design is pretty simple. Um, we have Nagios with a Merlin module running inside it. So Merlin is a two component system, a two piece, two piece thing. And the Merlin daemon takes care of talking. It talks over a socket with a little backlog where you, where you can stash events if one of the ends has problems. Um, they share a configuration file because both of them have to know how many peers they have configured and how many, well, where they are and stuff like that. Um, the Merlin daemon takes care of communicating with the network and synchronizing with other peers and then it just ships it back to the, to the module as well. We added database support to Merlin back in 2009 or 2000, yeah, 2009, because back then NDO Utils had some serious performance issues uh, when it came to larger installations. So our database schema is a lot simpler than, than what NDO Utils uses. Um, in OP5 Monitor 6.0, which is out in January, we will be uh, converting our UIs to use live status instead because it performs a lot better and it means that we can stop using a database which gets updated all the time but it is only looked at sometimes so we can get rid of some load there <coughs> if we look at this uh, when you t have two peers talking to each other you see that it's actually two separate systems and the big black arrow there is supposed to connect the two demons together. Um, this will be the same even if it's a peer, uh, if, you, if it's a master in a polar or whatever it is. Uh, they'll just, it'll look about the same. <coughs> so, a peer setup. This is what a lot of our customers actually use. We recommend that uh, you should be able to lose one peer and still have, uh, have at least 20% capacity left to be able to do your monitoring. Otherwise, you're not really using a redundant monitoring solution. If you can't lose one system and still keep on checking everything the way you're supposed to, it's not redundant. So uh, most of our larger customers, they use three peers. Uh, some of them use a lot more. Um, but this is a pretty simple setup. You just tell the peers, hey, guys, you're going to be working together. Um, here you are, all of you. Uh, and they start talking together. You can see that configuration and check results and everything is synchronized. Um, this also handles commands, by the way, which is a pretty big pain in the ass to do when you're, when you're dealing with uh, send an SEA or whatever kind of, of other types of redundancy you're, you're looking at. So external commands will be forwarded to all the nodes that need to know about them. Um, it's very easy to, to uh, extend this. If you buy another company that you need to monitor another thousand hosts, you just put in another peer or two, and then you're done. You can provision them virtually as well. We don't recommend people doing that because with Nagios 3, the uh, IO load and the fork rate was not good for uh, virtual machines. With Nagios 4, that will most likely change. Um, master polar setup. Boop, 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 boop. Remote modules allow the monitoring of individual services and devices using a dedicated but centrally managed monitoring system. So you will do your configuration on the master server and then you will just push it out to the pollers. Or the pollers will go and fetch it from the master if you have firewall issues with sending it to them. Um, this is a system, actually, no. We'll go to the next slide instead. But here you can see the configuration only goes from the master to the po master to the polar, and the pollers keep sending check results and status updates, and uh, they keep sending basically anything that happens to their objects. So the master will have the same scheduling queue for each individual item that the, each polar is monitoring. So if we take one polar out, the master will just, oh, I'm going to take this over because the polar went to lunch or whatever. <coughs> And you can, of course, have redundancy in every layer. This is what we're using to monitor our own network, and this is what a lot of our larger, net, uh, larger customers use. It's pretty straightforward, really. Um, the original design here was that you were supposed to be able to have pollers in several layers. So they would have one polar 
concentrator for Asia and then uh, Bangkok, Beijing, uh, Kyoto, wherever they did their gas stuff. But um, right now, it's of the officially supported is to have uh, two layers. The reason for this is pretty stupid. The only thing that happens is that if you have paired polars in the, in, in the second layer, and they in turn have polars as well, they will, when you save the configuration, it gets pushed from the master server. All of the polars at the same time will notice that their polars have an outdated configuration and try to push it. Nothing bad happens because they're pushing the same configuration, but it re the level three polars will restart twice or three times. Sometimes. Depends a bit on the timing and how that works. Um, no one has actually asked to have uh, polars in more layers than this, so I haven't bothered to fix it. It's not that hard. But I think that with Nagios 4, we're much more likely to have remote workers instead if you want to put uh, more stuff beneath them. <coughs> Configuration and management. Merlin will automatically distribute object configuration for you. Um, this is ridiculously fast, actually, and it will be even faster with, with Nagios 4 because I rewrote how Nagios objects are cached. So now we can use, now we can use Nagios' own uh, caching function, just mark the objects that we need to distribute, and I will most likely make that a core patch where Nagios can split objects based on host groups so that you can reuse the same code for any type of redundancy or high availability solution or distributed monitoring. Um, for peers, the configuration is just synchronized completely. Uh, you can also tell it to, to ship a bunch of other files if you want that. And uh, for the master polar setup, you can also tell it to, to just ship a bunch of extra files. Otherwise, it's just split the configuration and send it out. So every polar always gets a pre-cached we split it from the object's cache file. So every polar gets uh, a pre-cached version of their configuration. Mogul are the early adopters. They actually started using this when it was way before beta. Um, and that was pretty hilarious. Uh, apparently, there are no other solutions that provide the kind of high availability with any tool. Any tool. Uh, HP OpenView can't do it. And they have been looking at all the big ones because their availability requirements are 100%. Exactly 100%. They can't have one second of downtime. They have quadruple, uh, quadruply redundant systems for everything that they do, which is pretty normal considering what they actually do. But uh, it means that they have, to, they have to have clever synchronization there. Um, so they have peer masters with multiple polars, and they have these extreme availability demands. <coughs> I was in Merlin 0 0.7 beta 1, which they started using. So I actually went to their place, in, uh, and I spent a week or so there, um, and finishing up the redundancy support. They were very happy. Um, examples and scenarios. So this is a setup you would use for a fairly large, uh, fairly large network. I think Jason Cook is using something similar, except he has, oh yeah, six peers. And then Gearman workers underneath that. That works just fine. You can use Merlin along with Mod Gearman and BNX and other types of checking modules. Uh, it will work just fine with Nagios 4 and remote workers and stuff like that as well. So. Um, <coughs> what, happen, what happens here is that if you want to add more nodes or if your network grows, you just provision up a new, new peer in the virtual environment or whatever and add it. And like you can see here, if you lose two of them, the monitoring will just keep on going. Um, security. This is the the red zone network stuff that I've been talking about. Um, this is a setup that actually that fits into a lot of companies. Um, if you're into any sort of banking or media distribution or you handle transactions in any way or you do defense work or you do whatever, you will have secret networks that can't talk to the outside of the company without 
special firewall rules. Uh, Merlin sorts that out by just attempting to connect from both ends, and the one that succeeds, they, it will use that connection. So uh, the polar here will try to, so you can put your, your master server on a, on, in the secured network that gets to talk to everything, and then the master node will connect to the polar. Or if the polar is inside the secret network, it will connect to the master, assuming you can talk to it, assuming you can get through the firewall, of course. Um, this is also a very popular solution for people that are uh, managed service providers or, uh, or large-scale internet service providers because they can sell a polar to their customers and say, hey, do you want monitoring with your virtual servers or your cloud hosts or whatever? And the customers can then log into their own polar, which is actually a full-blown user interface and has everything that they need. And they can't mess up the, the master installation. It doesn't really matter if we mess up authentication because the, their customers will always be in a separate little island of their own where they can't see anything that any other customer has or knows about. And it's a pretty popular deal, apparently. <coughs> um, you can, of course, do cloud monitoring as well. Uh, we have people that have bought Monitor and they sell pollers in the cloud as a sort of uh, online outside the network service, uh, just only to do these, like how do our users see this? Can we get to that side from the internet? Can we get here and there? What's, what's, what does it look like from the outside? Uh, also a pretty popular service actually. And for really large organizations, I have to decode this myself, so it would just give me half a minute. All right, right. This includes the presentation layer. So if you have really large networks, you will most likely want to have, you want a snappy user interface uh, to keep going for you. So the master servers will not do any checks at all. They will just listen to results that come in from pollers or from wherever. Um, this is likely to, to change slightly because we will most likely put up uh, top level user interfaces using the nerd radio where we can just send the small chunks of data that we need, uh, create something like MK multi-site or maybe we'll just use MK multi-site. Life status is pretty fucking awesome actually. Um, ah, this is cool. The customer case study, we have Viking Line. They have 27 cruise ships, I think. They, uh, these cruise ships, when they, uh, when they put in the harbor, it costs a lot of money. And since we've had a few, well, a couple of boats sank in the Baltic Sea a couple of years ago. Have you heard about Estonia? Anyways, um, their uh, boats nowadays, ships, are required to have uh, um, redundant security systems online all the time. If one of them fail, these guys used to have a technician, an engineer, call out to the boat and say, and they would sit on the phone and run down a checklist. Watch this system, check this system, check this system. Because if anything was broken, they needed to have an engineer on site when the boat put in to take on new travelers and whatever they do. Uh, they're using OP5 Monitor, so each ship has its own polar. And they're using really, really crappy satellite links uh, to send the data back to the, back to the main office, which means that they no longer have to do the checklist thing. They no longer have to risk missing anything. And the fines for running a, sh a cruise ship without the security protocols in place are, they would have to sell a boat or two to get out of that. So um, I, I told them that this may not work. This might be complete and utter crap. Um, you're just going to have to try it and see if it works for you. Uh, but they did some tests, and while check results are coming in like 10 or 15 minutes after they're supposed to, they always have a, uh, the engineers on board the ship can always look at the screen, and that's part of their routine now, but they don't have to go and check everything manually. So they have a screen with, say, 120 checks or something. It's not that much. It's just like pressure valves for the engine and stuff like that. But um, if anything is read, they, just, they can just phone in. But the, the, uh, the uplinks are actually working good enough to get the data back to, to, the, 
to the main office so they can have their engineers on place, on site, when the boat puts in. And it's, I was really surprised. I did not think that would work, but apparently it does. So it, it's using Merlin's in own internal backlog to stash the data when it has a shitty uplink. Um, you actually can't configure that. It's uh, no one's asked for that to be possible, but it stashes enough data and just ignores the ignores the events that are too old, and then it sends it back up to the master, and the master will just oh yeah okay, so now it's that, and it's they can hire basically a 15 year old to sit and watch the screen for. And if you see red, tell someone. <laughs> That's basically what they're doing, actually. I think the, the janitor's son got a job there. <laughs> <laughs> Retarded. Um, yeah, so that's a, pretty, that's a pretty cool case, actually. I always feel a slight sense of pride when I go aboard one of those boats and I turn on the infotainment systems. I know that they're working because, <laughs> yeah. That's about it. Questions, anyone? Eric? So uh, when you've got a, a master and then peers underneath it, and the master is uh, Merlin's carving up the config to send you know, only partial configs to each of the peers, how does Merlin decide how to carve up the configs? Uh, based on host groups. So you assign oh, a okay. specific host group or several host groups to one or more peers. Okay. Um, word of warning there, if you have peer, uh, if you have uh, pollers, sorry, uh, my hungover croakiness is not very good at this. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a bad idea to assign one host group, to assign a, uh, a split set. So if you have host groups A, B, and C, and pollers one and two take care of A and B, it would be bad to have polar 3 take care of B and C. It's not the same set. So if you have peered polars, they should take care of the exact same host groups, and no other polar group should take care of those host groups. It usually makes sense to, that's the only way that it really makes sense to do it, but um, yeah. Is there any other way to carve it up, like maybe even um, physical directory structure? <sighs> well, yeah, you could do directory. you could do that, but Merlin will split the configuration anyway, so it, it doesn't. You could tell it not to not to uh, push configuration to its to its peers, but if the ma if the master gets check results for a host or a service it doesn't know about, then it's just going to throw it away. It's not going to automatically create the the stuff just because they exist on a polar. So the master always needs the master set, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you want to do your configuration there. Uh, basically. Cool, thanks. Yep. <coughs> so I'm assuming for just for smaller setups, so you have, you know, I don't know, a couple thousand hosts, two data centers, can you use it just for pure HA so that if your Nagios server goes down at one site, it can just come back up on the other site? Yeah. Okay. That's that's one of the major reasons. It's uh, so it won't attempt through cool. scalability and attempt to split out the workload. You can just set it up to purely be HA. Um, well, y no. Well, yeah, you can, but that would involve having a. Uh, then you would have one master server and a polar underneath it, and the polar is responsible for checking everything. Then it would just fail over up to the master when the polar goes down. But if you have them peered. They will share the workload while both of them are up. And if one of them fails, the other one will take over all the checks for the first one. So uh, what you're talking about sounds like the have one server stand and do nothing while the other one is working a lot. And if that one fails, we take over. Yeah, more but or less. Yeah, that's, that's something that doesn't really make sense to us, actually. Because if you have two servers, they might as well start working both of them. What's well, um, more so? If you have sort of a hot site, uh, what's beginning to get quite popular is with virtual environments is to have a live site and a hot site. So that if your live site comes down, everything will just start up on the hot site. Okay. Um, for something like monitoring, it'd be good if it was already there and available before um, that comes down. But you wouldn't really want it running actively because it might be slower to run checks um, okay. from that side. Um, I haven't really thought about it. 
Um, yeah, well, you can do that in the in the the master polar setup that I told you about. It would uh, it doesn't really make sense to us to do that, and we still tell our customers mostly to use physical hardware so that they can measure how the virtual machine is working from outside the virtual machine. Is yep. it, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, you can do that. It, um, I have a hard time seeing where it would be more useful than having them share the load from the start. But, but yeah, you can do that. Cool. Anyone else? Mr. Vegas. A uh, couple more questions dealing with the distribution. You said it's host group based uh, where I guess one question I have is all of our hosts are going to be members of multiple host groups. One of the characteristics might be geographic. The next might be a class of device, router switch, access point, WLAN controller. And the third might be the man, um, a host group for specific manufacturers and, and models. So okay. All our hosts are going to be members of many different host groups. How, when you say you distribute the load by host group, what what takes priority? Um, do you choose the host group? Does it choose the host group? You choose the host group. Okay. You configure it and you say, uh, this is the polar, here's the address, here's the port we should connect to, and here are the host groups that this polar should be responsible for. Okay, so that's an administrative selection. Yeah. Uh, second, when you talk about the topology and parent structures yeah. for, for hosts uh, and devices not knowing anything about something it's not monitoring, at, at some point, our parent's going to be, the parent for a device at some level is going to end up being monitored by a different server. How does, how does Merlin or Nagios handle that when, uh, when the parent ends up being on a different distributed server? Um, you set up the... Uh, you set up the Merlin Polar as the uh, as the parent to its immediate children that it's monitoring underneath there. Usually, people do that, uh, but otherwise you have uh, because from the point of view of the Polar, the thing that is you don't have to go through the through the switch you need to go through to reach the Polar for the Polar to be able to reach the stuff that it is monitoring, so. Um, a, a, a provably unsolvable problem is what to do when the uh, when the polar is online and the master is online and they both think that they are not that the other one is not, so they're checking but from different different areas in the network. Then the the polar will usually see that everything is up, while the master, which can't talk to the polar and therefore often can't talk to anything on that network, will see everything is down. Uh, you have this split vision problem there, but the, the master will have the parents for everything, basically. And yeah, the polar... Yes. Uh, so uh, it, it does make sense when you, when you look at it, because the parent dependencies aren't, aren't there for the polar. So when the polar is monitoring things, it, they don't really matter. And the master can still have them. Okay, yeah, because yeah. it's, it's only for notification suppression. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, yep. thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, it's been a couple years since I've, uh, I've messed with Merlin, but if I recall correctly, the last time I went through it, um, the docs seemed to have this unwritten assumption that um, I needed, or that I wanted uh, Merlin talking to a MySQL database. Um, I'm not using Ninja, and I'm not using any of like the op BOP5 front ends, is that strictly necessary? Or? No, you can run Merlin without having to talk to a database at all. Uh, one good thing with the Merlin database is that it has, the, it has one table that where it keeps track of state changes. State changes is what you need to calculate availability reports, for instance. Uh, it tracks when something moves from a soft to a hard state, from a hard to a soft state, and between any OK warning and critical. Normally, when you look at logs, you really don't care if you had six check attempts that all failed. You see that, oh, here it went from uh, hard OK to soft critical, and 10 minutes later or two minutes later, it went to hard critical. That's, uh, that's the only thing we stash in that, in that table, and it's immensely useful for generating reports. It's basically a, a 
split down. Or, or what's it? It's a half truncated version of the Nagios logs. So, uh, but you don't need it to run Merlin. Definitely not. The only thing you need to do is to not configure a database in your uh, Merlin configuration, and it won't use one. It's as simple as that. Or you can even have it configured and say use database equals no. That works too. Any further questions for Andreas? Is everyone hungry here? <laughs> All right, I think we're going to break. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>